And we do give praise to the Lord for all that he has done, all that he will do for us. We're glad that we have this opportunity to come together in fellowship here at Harlandale Christian Church. We're glad that you're with us today to worship and praise our God and our Lord for all that he has done, for his love, for his protection, for his provision for us. The psalmist in Psalm 105 uh, speaks to that uh, praise to the Lord for what he has done when he says, uh, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. So today here as we gather at Harlandale, uh, we seek the face of our God and a, a face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise him and we pray to him. Let's go to him together in prayer as we begin our worship time. Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you have done. The record of the scriptures, the, the things that we know in our own lives, the things that you have done. Thank you for your promise to watch over us, to protect us, to provide for us. And most of all, Father, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Through him we have your grace and mercy and redemption from our sins. Thank you for that, Father. For this, we rejoice in you, we praise you, Again, we thank you. So today I pray that you receive our worship and our adoration as we remember all that you have done for us and your promises of what you will do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, 
me 
our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Each Lord's Day as we gather together for worship, as we fellowship with each other and we fellowship with our God, we gather at the Lord's table and share in this communion time. We partake of the bread, the unleavened bread that reminds us of the body of our perfect Savior, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, as he was pierced and nailed to the cross of Calvary so that when we believe in him and accept him as savior, 
we might have the remission of sins. We partake of the cup, the fruit of the vine, that reminds us of his blood, that he, our Savior, willingly shed on that cross so that we might be washed, our sins might be washed away, and we might be washed as white as snow. In this act, this act of love, this act of grace and mercy, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ became and becomes our Redeemer. We remember his sacrifice, we remember his love, and we look forward to the time when he comes again to receive us to himself and to our Father, our God in heaven. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these emblems that Jesus provided to his disciples before he went to that cross. And even as he told them, and then the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to the church in Corinth, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do. We partake of these emblems today, this bread, the cup, to remember your love, the sacrifice of your only begotten Son, and we remember that there is only one Redeemer, your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. There is a Redeemer, Jesus our Savior. We celebrate him and we remember him as we partake this morning. Bless us in this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I'm guessing that most of you here today uh, probably use Facebook. And if you're like me, that's about all the social media you can handle. I do have accounts for LinkedIn and Twitter. And we know that there are other social networking sites out there. And of course, LinkedIn is a site geared more toward uh, professionals and, and business and work. MySpace was the first global social networking site, and it's still around. Believe it or not, MySpace still has about 34 million registered users. But by far the most popular social network, besides Facebook, is Twitter. And it's said that just a few years ago, they probably had over 200 million registered users on Twitter. Now the word Twitter comes from that chirping sound made by birds. So the bird is used in the Twitter logo. Twitter is very similar to Facebook, but one of the features that made Twitter unique is that it only allowed you to create posts with 140 characters. Now that's been upgraded, so now you can in fact uh, type in up to 280 characters. It's still maybe only uh, two, three, maybe four sentences long. No long-winded diatribes, no soapbox lectures. Your posts or your tweets, as they're called, have to be short and to the point. And that got me to thinking, what if God had a Twitter account? What would he say? What would he tweet? You know, the Bible is a pretty long book, isn't it? And that might give the impression that every single book in the Bible is long, too. And especially when we, when we look at the book of Psalms and we know how, that there are, uh, long, that's the longest book in the Bible and the longest chapter of the Bible is in the Psalms. But it's not true that every book of the Bible is long. It actually has some almost tweetable documents included in the Bible. Did you know that there are five books of the Bible that only have one chapter? All of them are under 500 words and would have fit on a single sheet of papyrus. And while they're technically too long for a tweet on Twitter, these five books are short personal messages from God to his spokesman and to his followers, much like Twitter is today for us. But their shortness, their brevity, actually points to their urgency. So I'd like to spend the next few Sundays examining these tweets from God, if you will, to see what urgent message God might have for us even today. The first of these one chapter books is found in the Old Testament. And, and according to BibleGateway.com, this one chapter book is, the prom, is listed as the least popular book of the Bible, or at least the, the least read of any book in the Bible. And this book is named Obadiah, after the prophet who wrote the message of God. So maybe we can think of Obadiah as maybe the coolest book you've ever read because it's so short and it packs, packs a punch. It's about a third of the way through your Bible right before the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bible or an app on your phone, open it up and we'll see what lessons we can draw from this bite-sized book. This book of Obadiah is a brief prophetic word about the nearby nation of Edom, near to Israel and Judah. And it's not good news for Edom. Israel has a long-standing rivalry with this nation, but now Edom has gone too far. And when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem in the temple of God, Edom was there cheering on the Babylonians. So God sends his messenger to them a man named Obadiah. Interesting note that the, the name Obadiah is Hebrew for 
servant of Yahweh. And through Obadiah, God swears to turn the tables on Edom. Obadiah's message is a simple one. No matter how safe they think they are, no matter how wise they think they are, Edom will not get away with this. The letter breaks naturally into two sections. The first section focuses on Edom's downfall. The Israel versus Edom rivalry is more than just two nations who don't get along. This struggle begins in the book of Genesis, actually. The Israelites are the descendants of Jacob, while the Edomites are the descendants of Jacob's brother, Esau. And you might remember, Jacob and Esau didn't get along so well as brothers. Jacob stole Esau's birthright, and Esau was ready to kill him for it. Eventually, the brothers resolved their differences, and God gave both of their descendants a land to inhabit. Esau's descendants became the nation of Edom, while Jacob fathered the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, uh, Israel's capital was Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is. Edom's was Mount Seir. And both of these nations, both of these people had an inheritance. Both had a mountain. Only one was God's chosen people. And as time went on, the relationship between their descendants became strained more and more. So when Babylon attacked Jerusalem, Edom actually sided with the Babylonians, cheering them on and even helping them out. So what does God have to say to and about Edom? First, he criticizes their pride. The Lord says to Edom in Obadiah verse 2, See, I will make you small among the nations. You'll be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock and make your home on the heights, and you who say to yourselves, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. In Proverbs 16, 18, you might remember this verse, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. And that was about to become true for these Edomites in, based on what Obadiah had to say to them. Of course, they aren't the only people in, in history and in the Bible to suffer from this inflated ego. I'm reminded of the story that was told of a preacher who was sorting through the church mail and he noticed a handwritten card from an anonymous woman. The card began, Dear Pastor, and he went on to compliment his preaching, even comparing him to Billy Graham. The card ended saying, I truly believe that you're one of the best preachers of all time. Well, imagine that. The preacher was just glowing. He took the card home with him, and, and he proudly showed it to his wife, who promptly looked at the envelope and said, but there's been a mistake. Well, preacher asked, what do you mean, a mistake? Don't you think I'm one of the best preachers of all time? Well, his wife said, sure I do, honey, but this card's addressed to the church down the street. <laughs> Oh, Benjamin Witchcoat said, None are as empty as those who are full of themselves. Have you ever met a prideful, arrogant person? Prideful people are always telling you about themselves, their accomplishments, and how smart and how wonderful they are. And then they look at you to, conti to continue that conversation about themselves and to affirm how magnificent they are as if they're comparing themselves to you. We all know people like that, don't we? We don't like being around people like that, do we? Someone once said, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. Well, Edom's pride was even making God sick. But pride wasn't Edom's only problem. God also condemns their plundering. In verse 13, 
The Bible says, You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. Listen, Edom saw Israel's loss as their gain. They took advantage of this opportunity. With Israel being captured and deported to Babylon, the Edomites looted Jerusalem and rejoiced in, in the, the, the bad fortune that Israel had suffered. They betrayed their blood brothers, their relatives, in a time of crisis, and they helped Israel's enemies. Edom even went so far as to capture the escaping Israelites and turn them over to Babylon to earn brownie points with the Babylonian Empire. Wow. In other words, the Edomites were looking out for themselves, and they did, they did not hesitate to capitalize on Israel's misfortune. And if you've, given enough, if you've, if you've even been betrayed, if you've ever uh, been taken advantage of, you can probably relate to this relationship. Maybe there's been someone in your life who you thought ought to stick up for you, but instead they just threw you under the bus. Well, friends, the good news is God is watching, and God will not let them get away with it. I'm reminded of the burglar who broke into a nice house in a wealthy neighborhood, and as he was stealing the valuables and loading them into his duffel bag, he heard a voice out of the darkness that said, Jesus is watching you. He froze. And he looked around. But he didn't see anyone, so he thought maybe it was just his guilty conscience getting to him. He started to grab some more stuff and put it in the bag, but he heard it again. Jesus is watching you. So he flipped on his flashlight and he noticed a bird cage with a cover over it, over on the side. The words came from the cage, Jesus is watching you. So the thief pulled off the cover and he saw a parrot. What's your name, little fella, he asked. The parrot said, Moses. <laughs> the, the thief laughed and he, and, he, and he asked, what kind of person would name a parrot Moses? And the parrot said, the same kind of person that would name a Rottweiler, Jesus. <laughs> well, just like that Rottweiler in that joke, God is watching. God is watching. He knows what you've been up to. He knows what I've been up to. And he knew what Edom had been up to. God criticized Edom's pride, condemned their plundering, and ultimately, he confirms their punishment. In verses 15 and 16 of Obadiah, God says, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. In other words... What goes around, comes around. Soon and very soon, the tables would turn for Edom. God would make certain that Edom received the punishment that Edom deserved. Now listen, friends, the same is true for everyone who continues to fight and rebel against God even today. The punishment of Edom, I think, points us toward an even more apocalyptic punishment that's looming on the horizon. The Bible says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who troubled you. He will punish those who do not know God and, do not, and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The downfall and the destruction of the nation of Edom serves as a, a sobering wake-up call, a warning, a reminder to us. Preacher and commentator A.W. Tozer has said, 
This vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the conscience of millions of people. It is true. God's love and patience are infinite. But so is God's holiness and justice. He simply cannot allow evil to continue forever. And who would want him to? Edom's downfall was just part of God's message through the prophet Obadiah. Before ending this letter, this prophecy, he also includes some encouraging words about Israel's deliverance. And so he speaks to the children of God. God disciplines his people, but he still comes to their defense. Think about this. The book of Obadiah was written about the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. That's an event that God brought about for Judah's punishment. Judah had forsaken him and started worshiping false gods. But even when he's punishing them, God has Judah's back. God has plans for Israel, plans for hope, and plans for a future. So Obadiah goes on to say in verses 20 and 21, this company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephtha. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Zephyrath will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. In this, Obadiah reminds the children of Israel that God has not forgotten about them. First, Obadiah prophesied that God's people would be rescued. Just as God had promised, he judged the Babylonians for their sins, and the Babylonian Empire fell to the armies of Persia in 539 B.C., Two years later, the Jews were set free by King Cyrus of Persia, once again proving that God's, God's promises are true. Obadiah also prophesied that God's people would be restored. He assured them that they would return home and they would resettle in the, in the city and the outlying villages, and that's exactly what happened. They returned under the direction of Ezra, who led, uh, who led to a revival among the Jewish people. And they began rebuilding the walls of the city, of the temple, and rebuilding their homes. And finally, Obadiah prophesied that God's people would be raging. He says in verse 18, Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no more survivors from Esau. Well, history says in 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus led Israel's army in routing the Edomites. And by the first century, Edom ceased to exist. At the time of Obadiah's prophecy, Edom may have seemed more likely to survive than Judah, Israel. But Edom has vanished from history. And the people of God still populate the earth. Well, here's what I want you to get out of this book. If God had a Twitter account, I think he would sum up the little book of Obadiah this way. I always stick up for my children. Friends, God always sticks up for his children. If you're a child of God, there may be days when he disciplines you. There may be times that he brings difficulties or allows difficulties into your life to correct your behavior, just as he did with the Israelites. But even when God is not happy with your behavior, he's still got your back. When other people take advantage of you, abuse you, betray you, God's watching. And no matter how smart or successful or safe they think they are, 
God will not let them get away with it. And just as God had plans for Israel, he has plans for you and me. Plans for hope and a future. Maybe you're down and out right now. Maybe you feel beat up and bullied by life. But God has plans to rescue you, restore you, and set a roaring fire inside of you. This is the God whom we serve, a God who is steadfast and faithful to his promises and to his people. God will always have your back when you are a child of God. Friends, maybe today you can relate to Israel and Edom. Maybe you've been wrestling with pride. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you failed to help when you should have. On the other hand, maybe you've been on the receiving end of someone else's uh, faults and duplicity. You should know that God is always there for you when you need him. The best thing you can do is trust in him. If I can help you with that, then I want to encourage you to, to talk with me. We're going to close our service today with a song that reminds us that great is the faithfulness of God. And great was his faithfulness to his people, Judah, the nation of Israel, his children. Great is his faithfulness to us today through his son, Jesus Christ, when his son is our Lord and our Savior. Trust in his faithfulness, trust in his promises, and walk with him. As, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message, short but to the point, even from the Old Testament. Thank you for the assurance that, that when we are your children, when we have come to you through your son Jesus, you see when we are oppressed, when we are downfallen. We know and we thank you for providing us the way to come to you, even when we are not Israelites, Jews, the Old Testament people. Thank you for making us your children through your grace, through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Oh God, great is your faithfulness. Help us remember your presence and your help in our lives today and every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See
Batista 